What does it take to become an elite 40K player? How do the top competitors overcome bad dice? The Competitive 40K Network presents Art of War Unbroken. Insight into the game plans of the top players on the planet with your hosts, Blake Law and the Art of War Coaches. Hello and welcome to Art of War Unbroken. Champions may lose, but their spirit remains unbroken. I'm your host, Blake Law. This is episode 14 of the podcast, and we're glad you're able to join us today. They say we learn the most from our losses, and that's exactly what this show aims to do. We are interviewing elite players who have lost a single game, and we're looking to break down the mistakes and how they learn from them moving forward. How often have you blamed a game on bad dice? We've all done it. I've done it. You've done it. Richard Siegler's done it. So we're aiming to debunk that today. We're going to have a little bit of a different episode today. Today we're going to focus on how to win with subpar armies and kind of break down the mindset and the way to approach games with that in mind. We're not going to per se do exactly what we do in the past where we break down a game. We're kind of do more general concept. We are going to break down a game still, but that's not the main goal of today's episode. So in part one, we're going to talk about winning with the underpowered armies. We are going to do a brief, uh, going briefly into a game, but we're not going to focus solely on that. In part two, we're going to flip the script completely, and we're just going to talk about Tau. I know it's been done, but you can't have an episode in 2021 with our guest today and not talk about Tau for an hour. It's basically impossible. So that's what we're doing. We're just going to talk Tau for an hour in part two. Okay, so our co-host today is known for his many jingles. He sings jingles every episode, including the Sean Naden Pokemon theme, the Yellow Rose of 40K, the Rocky Top of 40K. He has won many imaginary majors, including the Battle of King Nothing 2025. A player so in tune with his own podcast, he loses most of his games just to live the unbroken spirit. I am, of course, talking about myself, Blake Law. We have no co-host today. Our guest today, in the distant future, the world is falling apart around us. Scientists frantically look for solutions as to what went wrong. They scrambled to create something to save us all. That solution? A robot filled with all the knowledge of French history and tabletop dominance. They sent this robot back in time to stop Brad Chester from winning and ultimately preventing the fallout that ensues. We are absolutely blessed to have this robot joining us today as a guest. He won LVO, Nova, Pro Tabletop, Warzone Atlanta all in one year leading to a a 2019 ITC championship. He taught us all how to love again when he finished top eight at Atlantic City with Tau. We are, of course, talking about Mr. Re- Richard Siegler, a.k.a. Tau Robot 3000. Thanks so much for that introduction, Blake. Waking me up from cryo chamber here. I'm glad to be here. Should we let them eat cake? That is the burning question. Uh, Nick is the person who always says that. And just every time he just can't get it through his skull. So uh, I just accepted it at this point. All right, so we're here talking about um, winning with underpowered armies, which I think you've become the poster child for in the last couple of months with your Tau performance over in Atlantic City. So just tell us a little bit about that. Just tell us, you know, what was going on back in, what was it, a month or two ago in Atlantic City, back in June? Yep, back in June. So, uh, yeah, like you said, Tau, at the end of 8th edition, uh, they were a very monodimensional but strong army. Amazing defensive tools. Um, and then they got this uh, supplement, the Farsight Enclave supplement, which introduced an entirely new play style. And right around when COVID hit, those rules had come out, and they were gonna. I was going to show them off at Adepticon for the first time and try and win that event. Got canceled. I wasn't able to go to any events for a long time, and I kind of kept that in my back pocket. I knew the rule set was good. Transitioning into 9th edition, Tau got a lot of points increases, unfortunately, especially on their defensive mechanics, and they also lost uh, Fall Back and Shoot which on all that fly stuff was a key way in which the army functioned. You don't shut it, you can't shut it down, keep shooting you, tables you eventually, uh, but it also plays the mission very well. So I stopped playing Tau for quite a bit. However, in January, Tau got some awesome points decreases, not amazing ones, but uh, at least the, the veteran crisis suits and crisis suits in general went down five points a model. And they also got access to, um, it started being ruled at tournaments that Monka allowed fall back and shoot. And that was later confirmed by a Games Workshop FAQ. So that meant Monka, once per game on a commander, lets you fall back and shoot in a six inch aura. However, Farsight Enclaves has Farsight, who lets you do it twice. Twice is enough where I start to get interested. Now I have some reliability. Even if I get tagged once, my opponent's probably going to have a hard time doing it a second time. So this is when I started reconsidering Tau. 
And I started designing, you know, starting at the baseline that I had at the end of 8th edition with a lot of small MSU breacher units, a lot of small OBSEC units, uh, a lot of two-man drone units to help play the mission, a couple of commanders um, to do some firepower and be my uh, while we stand, which is now to the last, and then take a riptide or two. So started with that core and, and built around it. Now, the mission design is very different in 9th edition. It's much more uh, about board control. Uh, especially, you know, throughout the entirety of the game rather than in a couple turns. So I had to build around that, and I played a couple practice games. I played into Nick Nanavati's Death Guard and actually did. I won that game very narrowly, but it reinforced the point that I was trying to do is speed is something that Tau does very well, and they also do the secondary game amazingly well. In that game, I think I, I got almost max secondaries, um, and I built this list, uh, the core of it at least, to always do engage in all fronts, get about 13. Maybe if I'm uh, if I'm really good turn one, I'll get uh, 15 points out of it. To the last, which was uh, while we stand at that point, get 15 on it automatically, the Riptide, the Commander, Survive, uh, the Crisis Unit, done. And then I would take um, what used to be uh, Deploy Scramblers. Now is Retrieve Octarius data. It's even better for Tau because there's more points and there's no uh, potential of getting a zero. So in that case, I would get 10 points on it almost all the time now you can get even more so who does that for you in the list is that most of the breachers so i have a combination i have the breachers and the devilfish which i can push up in the late game and disembark and then uh get get into the table quarters but i also have vespid which followed a ruling particular to aco and the wtc in general so the europeans typically play with this which is that the vespids and alien auxiliaries in general don't break the supplementary farsight trait to uh, count as having one marker light one more marker light on your opponent if you're within 12. So that meant I could throw Vespid into the detachment and run a single battalion, save a couple of command points, which is very nice. And yeah. I used them to ensure not only that my opponent had to scream me each turn to try and deny it, more things in my firing lanes, which is awesome. And that worked beautifully against armies like Jukari. And then I also uh, would get the scramblers with them. So they also move 14 inches. If your opponent screens it out, you can put them in the midfield on uh, kind of where your crisis unit is, and then the next turn move them up or save it for turn five, which is what I did in the game we're going to talk about against Mr. Nick Nanavati. So um, yeah. this list, it just uh, I'll break down the core of it for anybody who hasn't uh, heard of it. It's a Farsight, a Cold Star Commander with some missiles, a bunch of Breacher units. Uh, it's changed over time, but typically it's just mostly a couple five-mans, each with two drones, a Guardian drone to give them a five-up invul, and then either a Marker or a Gun drone, depending on how I'm feeling. Then I have the big unit of nine Crisis Suits, Eight of them have double missile pod ATS for extra AP. And um, then I have one guy who has the relic to ignore AP 1 and 2 in shooting. And uh, he has a 2-up armor as well. So pretty tanky. I give him the 4-up invuln uh, in this case just because in uh, in 9th edition, once you start taking damage on a model in a phase, you have to keep taking it. So I figured he's probably going to be, they're going to shoot something to get me to put it on him. I might as well give him the invuln as well. Um, and then I have a uh, unit of Vespid. I have two Remora drones, I have two Devilfish, and I have that Amplified Ion Accelerator Riptide who just sits back there and does some shoot and scoot stuff. Touches terrain, scaring terrain, shoots down 72 inches, and then uses his 2d6 move to get back behind that terrain. A really nice safe play there and awesome while we stand. Um, so that's the core of the list. One of the biggest things that I found was um, with the earlier versions is I just needed to keep emphasizing secondary points. So I slowly moved away from 10-man breacher units um, and, in, and an extra commander and instead moved toward just more mission-playing stuff. That's where the Vespids came in. That's where the single Remoras came in. So that was the core that I walked into ACO with. What do the Remoras do? I know um, a lot of people probably haven't seen them if they haven't played Modern Tau. Yeah. Uh, they collect tiers. Uh, tears, salt, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So if your opponent has any of it, the remorse are going to collect it, guaranteed. Now, what do they actually do? So they're an airborne unit. They're a flyer. And they can come in one to four-man units. They are T5, five wounds. They have a three-up armor save, and they count as in cover against shooting attacks. So basically a two-up armor if you don't have AP. Uh, they're also, also minus one to hit with that. And they can only be charged by units with a fly keyword. So um, in addition, they move up to 30 inches. Um, and... They can go into hover mode if you need them to. But the crucial thing about them is not only do they have these awesome defensive mechanics to help keep them alive, um, they got some burst cannons to help blink away at things, two missiles if you want to shoot them. But the real key th part about them is the airborne rule, where the fly keyword can only charge them, 
and it's the fact that they can score engage in all front points. Flyers are restricted in 9th edition from scoring a lot of stuff, but engage in all fronts is one of the things they can do, and so my plan was almost every single game is I'd send a Remora out turn 1 into my opponent's half of the board, try and hide it as much as possible, because it actually has a low profile, even though it doesn't benefit from obscuring terrain, and uh, just get me 2 points on engage. Don't need to throw nice. anything else up there. Um, but the move blocking, I would just throw it out in the front of an objective, and even though you can move through fly units, uh, flyer units now, you can th- move through their bases, you still have to end more than an inch away if you're not charging with the fly keyword. And so I'd be able to move them up, touch the very tip of an objective, so that my opponent can't end with an inch of it. So all those plays where they wanted to either, you know, Jukari has a lot of things without the fly keyword. They want to advance and charge onto an objective. If I have a Devilfish or Breachers out there, they'll easily get it. But with this, they'd have to charge Scourges or maybe a lot, or Kronos, but most true car or, or a Raider even. Um, but that's forcing more things and things they don't really re- want to trade in the middle of the table. Right. So it was great in, in the Drukari matchup, and uh, it's, it's great in pretty much every matchup. These Dreadnought Heavy Space Marine builds, being able to just slow them down from scoring primary points is a huge deal with Tau. Yeah, because you just put it right up there and you say, hey, yeah, you can't charge me. Or if you do, you're going to... Out, you're gonna put something out of position that you don't want out there. So that's, exactly, that's pretty cool. Um, before we jump too much into the game, we are gonna talk about your game versus Nick in the Final Four at Atlantic City. That's the game we're gonna kind of tap into and talk mm-hmm. about. You know, for you to analyze for us here. Um, what other armies do you consider as subpar right now? So, I mean, you have to define subpar is that you have below 50% win rate. Do you go by that type of metric? Are you going to go by the feel of the army, the amount of tools that they have, the amount of play styles in a single book? Because uh, even if you have one very powerful play style, the rest of the codex, you know, Tau, for instance, is you know horrendous. You're almost never seeing it on the tabletop in a like top-level competitive game. So um, I I'd think... I'd say armies that aren't being played often. Let's say armies that aren't being played often, and when they are, aren't necessarily doing super hot. I think uh, GSC are the poster childs of yeah. not doing well and not being seen. It's an extremely hard army to play. It was very high skill cap in 8th edition. They lost some very powerful rules in the Vigilist book, and then they obviously got points increases as well. And uh, they also don't survive on objectives very well. So because of that, they've struggled in this edition, but hopefully they'll get some love soon. And uh, I think Knights are especially Chaos Knights. Uh, I think Imperium Knights are a little better because they have access to the Majeras that can get a bunch of relics and stuff, uh, whereas the Chaos versions can't. And the Majeras have ignore cover and a boatload of shots um, and are also amazing in combat. So I think Imperial Knights are like mid-tier, uh, especially if you either run the Majera build or just tons of the War Dogs. I think Chaos Knights are a little worse than that, uh, in my opinion. So um, You might you know, prove me soon. right. I know you're running that, them. So I'm, I'm running Blake them is crying right now. I'm looking at his face. Uh, and then um, armies like most of the chaos honestly most of chaos corn demons are atrocious most demons are atrocious honestly you saw Nurgle do a little you know decent for a little while spamming beasts of Nurgle but that army just has very little damage output um, unless you ally in a lot of smite spam and even then um, it's tough against the the modern day uh, codexes so I think chaos is outside of Emperor's Children and uh, some niche demon builds, like the Keeper Spam. We haven't really seen uh, Chaos doing very well at all. I think they're on the struggle bus for the most part, which is unfortunate. Yeah, your boy Mark Perry with his Emperor's Children doing uh, doing some work right now, though. His list is craziness. Yeah, it's wild. Um, if you see, if if Yunari is counted as a faction, there you don't see them whatsoever. Um, I think Craft Worlds are down there. Pure Craft Worlds is struggling. Yep. You've started to see Craft Worlds come back a little bit. Um, in this meta because they have a lot of indirect uh, blast weapons, and that's actually good against Katari. So, you see uh, Sean he's, Naden. Uh, yep. Yeah, Sean Naden, has, he basically goes in the mid-board and, he, and just nickel dimes you and then just uh, indirects you all game, and it's pretty pretty fun build, actually. Yeah, I actually played against it at ACO. Um, but he, he's been allying Craft Worlds with Jukari, which is a, a decent enough mix, but uh, pure Craft Worlds kind of struggled as well. Um, I think for most people, Tau is down there as majorly underpowered mono play style, a play style that you need to play perfect to, and just outplay your opponent every game uh, to win with. So um, I would say those are down there. Orcs for a while until they got their new book were definitely in the in the bottom in my opinion. Um, and then, you know, stuff is getting new rules, but I think those are the, the most underpowered so far. 
Yeah, that makes sense. Those are all the things we're not seeing a lot of. When, when we do see it, it's either a very niche player like you were Sean Naden, you know, coming in and winning because you've played it a million times and you're an excellent player, or you see it at the bottom. You know, that's just kind of uh, kind of where we've seen it over the over the time. The reps but, definitely help. Just playing, like, leading up to ACL, I played, you know, like 20 games with Tau, at least. Wow. Uh, and you've played probably games. hundreds and hundreds, you know, over the last two years, I imagine, going into the 2019 season and all that. And, exactly. So. so Not with this exact list, but just Tau rules in general. Right. There, there's definitely um, a, a boon to be able to be a master of your faction. I think the question that I have, the, the biggest question I have for this episode is when you play with one of these armies you just listed, you know, typically if you're play testing, most people are playing pretty powerful armies going into majors. You know, they're picking up Drakari. They're picking up the yeah, new they orcs. They're picking up Admech. You know, a lot of people are doing that. And and the 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 key to that, you know, is like, all right, I'm playing this. You can easily see where your mistakes are because there's probably glaring if you made a, if you lost big time with that. But when you play with these underpowered armies, it can sometimes be a little more subtle. You know, you may not know why you lost. You might just say, hey, I lost because this army's bad. So what is your approach to playing and learning with the army like Tau? Oh, I, I've said this for a while, but Tau is a movement precision army. And typically when I lose, it's because I made small mistakes in positioning and that cost me big. So, you know, for example, I uh, have, have it set up where I, I ended up moving something I shouldn't have moved first, like a devil fish up. And now the units that want to come behind and uh, be screened by it, they don't roll high enough on their advance roll, for instance. Um, maybe it's the case where I'm setting up to do some really brutal overwatch but some of the units don't end up within six inches because I didn't do them in the correct order. You know, some things don't have the fly keyword, mm -hmm. like the breacher units. Um, I have to, you know, disembark things first and not sure what I'm going to get on my advance rolls. So there's a lot of sequencing in the movement phase, and then there's a lot of positioning things. So what to exactly move block objectives with? Um, CP discipline is another huge part of playing Tau. Most of your damage is reliant on stratagems like the reroll wounds, being able to ignore cover, all the benefits of cover for a CP. Um, your commander can reroll wounds for one CP. You can, um, you know, potentially be doing all sorts of uh, breacher strats, which I started out, once again, like I said, those 10-man breacher squads, and I spent a lot of CP on them, and I just kept not getting return and very quickly realized in playtesting, stop tempting yourself to spend command points on the breachers. You need to spend it on the crisis unit, just crisis, 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 crisis. So I had to learn the hard way of pumping, like double shooting Viola breachers with the rerolls and, you know, all the all sorts of stuff and uh, making their guns pistols so I could also shoot the pulse pistols. You just pump a ton of CP, wouldn't do anything, and I'd be like, oh my gosh, why did I do that? I just completely changed my late game because now I don't have CP to do all the interesting things to do. So if CP discipline is another huge part. It's just getting enough reps in that you know exactly which strats you need to prioritize. Um, yeah. Nick has pointed this out several times um, in other interviews, but I almost never use the command point reroll strat. The, yeah. almost, your other strats are pretty much better almost every single time. It'd have to be, this is going to win me the game, making like a four-up rerollable to win the game or something like that. Um, it's funny that you mentioned that because that's like a recurrent comment on this show. I think every single person who's come on this show, and I mean like across the board, when they talk about losses, we talk about what you would change or like your strategy. Almost every person exclusively says never, ever, ever use the reroll strat because it's just unless unless it's going to like guarantee you a chance to win the game, like because it's just not worth it as opposed to other ones. I think another huge issue with Tau is um, they don't have a lot of ways to interact in the charge phase with your opponent. So a big part of ninth edition is the mobility of using the charge phase as another movement phase to get onto objectives to deny primary, etc. So um, if you play the very battle suit heavy style with a lot of drones and stuff and you kind of sit and play a defensive castle style, you're never interacting with your opponent's um, uh, primary points unless the objectives are just wide out in the open and they don't have bodyguard rule and all sorts of stuff that have been introduced in ninth edition. So I had to build in mobile elements to be able to contest objectives, especially OPSEC. That's where I went with the the devil fish and the breachers and just used it as a relay system, try and get that devil fish in the middle of the terrain, disembark the breachers, advance them, get on the objective, or if I didn't need to advance, potentially just make a charge move. Um, and then late game, I needed to use the crisis suit unit often. If I whittle my opponent's damage enough that they can't actually wipe the whole thing and deny me five to the last points, I can send that unit out, get it crippled. If, if that happens, it's fine as long as I help deny primary points. And we'll talk about that game against Nick because crisis unit making a charge move late game was a key part of that. 
But um, you need to use the charge phase as another movement phase, just period, across the edition. Tau don't have a lot of crazy melee. The crisis unit is by far the best thing they have in melee, followed by Farsight himself, and I had both. And I tell you, Blake, I killed a lot of succubi at ACO. Um, <laughs> they have a strat where when you end the um, end with an engagement range for each model, you roll a three up, and you do a mortal wound. So I was able to just knock out things very quickly. And they also have a full rerolls to hit and wound uh, strat. They have a three up mortal. They have a three up mortal strat. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a better hammer God, of wrath. It's just three ups against amazing. whatever. Amazing. Exactly. You could finish off a knight, whatever you want. Um, but that that strat I use. You have to save CP for it though. And you have to How set many up are your places. units going in with that? It's a nine-man man unit. Oh, good lord! Oh yeah, yeah. You're putting out some damage with that, like yep. six wounds or so. Exactly. And then, or... yep. And then you uh, spend one CP if they're near the commander to reroll full hit and wound rolls, and they hit on fours because they're veterans and they're strength five. AP one from ATS, which works in combat. So is uh, that one CP or two? The full rerolls is the one CP. Both one okay, CP. That's pretty good. So yeah, that's pretty solid. But once okay. again, you're not pumping that into breachers or other nonsense. You got to you got to save all the CP for the crisis unit because it's going to carry the day. So yeah. I learned that, you know, just by putting enough reps into it. Um, just hearing you talk here about how, how you approach a game with a subpar faction, it makes a lot of sense. You, as opposed to looking at the big picture of I lost for X, Y, and Z, you got to really almost look at the micro game. Mm-hmm. you got to look at CP usage. you got to look at every little inch that you moved wrong. And I think that, and I think that's just across the board, just improving your play in general, yeah. not even subpar factions, goes back to movement. Movement is so freaking huge, and it has been forever. I mean, like, you look back every edition of 40K, movement's where games are winning and lost. Deployment, movement, you know, getting your getting your angle set up, getting firing lanes, you know, not just taking, getting half your army shot off the board, you know, at the get-go. Exactly, so, 100%. Firing lanes, uh, with Tau, you need to conserve every single resource because very often those two-man drone units that move up the table, they need to then get you engage points the next turn after their moors go away, you know, stuff like that. Um, or they need to start screening your opponent. So, um, and they can do that both at the same time. So often in your movement phase, every Tau unit is doing multiple things. It's setting up for angles for damage. It's setting up to help screen out. It's setting up to hold down and ensure I get this primary point or these secondary points. Every single model is set up to do multiple roles um, in this Tau list at least, uh, but often in, in most good armies. And uh, with being able to preserve every resource, you need to do a lot of pre-measuring with this. So my movement phases are by far the longest, and then the shooting phases and uh, you know combat, et cetera, go extremely quickly. So I do intentionally take as much time as possible in each movement phase because it's so precious. I need to do pre-measuring of all my opponent's angles, where their max, if they move their units at their max move, if they're able to advance, whatever. What firing angles are they going to be able to get? And what am I? what risks am I willing to take? If they roll the six on the advance, Am I willing to get an extra inch up closer to him um, that if he rolls the six, he'll be able to shoot it away, but then he's back in my firing lane. So you have to do calculated risks that come down to the just inches um, when you're playing a list like that. But in general, I just, whatever army I play, I do a ton of pre-measuring, and I pretty much measure out all the key distances of my opponent. If they have advanced and charge access, um, if they ha- if they want to be able to you know trap me in combat with Succubus, what's she going to need? What kind of risk am I willing to take there to try and tempt them to actually send that resource out so the crisis suits can can kill it in uh, in uh, melee. So um, it, it's a lot of calculated pre-measuring um, in, in the movement phase. So When you look at top players play even, like um, it was something when I got back in the game in ninth, I really noticed when I was looking at tables, you know, table one, two, three, you see a lot of top players measuring out they are they're measuring from their opponent's models they're measuring from the first second they get to the table you know till round five Mm -hmm. you're seeing a ton of people measuring out spaces being like all right this has a 24 inch threat i'm getting 25 inches away and and i think that's one of the things you don't see at the mid tables or low tables and something a lot of people don't really think about is you you really have to understand threat bubbles of your opponent and if you don't have that precise like you're going to lose a game just off of Oh, I was twenty three and a half inches away instead of twenty four. I just eyeballed it or whatever, you know. Yeah, I see people just bumble right into their movement phase, just start moving units. They're, you know, they might have a plan, a rough plan, but uh, the precision of, of the plan is not quite uh, well rounded. So uh, pre measuring is massive, absolutely massive. But it comes in combination with asking your opponent question questions. So even the top players don't know every single rule, you know, or, or remember it at the time. So. Uh, a, if you listen to a top table game, it's just constant questions between you and your opponent. So, you know, if this unit this unit has a 12-inch move, right, can it advance and charge? 
Um, can it, if it advance and shoot it, uh, what angle is it going to be able to get at? If I put my models here, am I going to be fine so that you can't shoot me? Um, same thing like before, if you roll a five in advance, you can't see me. If you roll the six, I'll accept that. Stuff like that. that uh, the top table game is just a constant conversation and a constant series of questions to you and your opponent. Um, so that kind of back and forth, you just start getting used to. And um, the other thing is I use a chess clock in every game. And that way I can keep my movement phases on on track, know that I'm not spending too much time on them. And, um, you know, the the time precision with playing an army like this, um, because it has a lot of little moving parts and everything needs to be so precisely done, it takes a lot of practice. So what I typically did uh, when I was, you know, learning Tau and, and just starting to be competitive um, in uh, late 2018 is I would just blank board at my house just go ahead and set up my army. I'd practice deploying and then the first couple turns of movement where every piece needs to go. Um, so just put down some typical terrain and just get used to the pace of moving it all and the decisions that you need to make. Uh, that can be really helpful. Yeah, I've heard, uh, I was talking to, I think it was Ryan Snyder at one point at one of the events, and he was talking about how he sets up, you know, mock battles on most. He'll put out his army and, and be like, all right, here's how I'm moving turn one versus this versus that. And I think that's a that's an interesting thought too, you know, just getting the reps in versus a ghost, you know, or yeah. I think that's that's an interesting thought at least. Let's go right into your game here versus Nick. I'm curious to see what uh, what you have to say about this. So it was it was the the elimination round. So you would won your first one, I think, versus was it Sean Naden that you played round one? Yeah, I played Sean Naden first. Uh, was able to take down his craft world Jukari mix, um, and then I'm heading into the semifinals against Nick. And uh, obviously, I play against Nick all the time. I played against this Drukari, and uh, I actually had beaten him in practice games. Uh, he had been playing a Drukari Harlequin mix, and I beat that. So I hadn't played against his pure uh, Drukari list, but I was still, uh, that event, I had played against several Drukari players already, and I, I was very confident in the matchup. The list was very fine-tuned to try and deal with. Um, not only, it was designed to deal with ACO terrain, which had a lot of open firing angles uh, across the board, so I was able to interact with um, his units in his deployment zone. And it also had to do with the Jukari heavy meta, which I expected at the top tables. Yeah. So uh, with both of those in mind, uh, we we rolled one of the harder missions for me, which is uh, the Dawn of War with the two objectives out in the open um, in the in on your deployment edge. And already I know he can... So it's close enough to a terrain piece that he could bodyguard rule with the Sliss and Urgles with his Archon. So he was going to automatically have an objective, um, and I wasn't going to be able to interact with the Slith Circles. So that was unfortunate. And then on top of that, um, because the objectives are out in the open, he still had a Dark Technomancer Rax, so he could you know, threaten to come up and just kill anything if I put uh, only a, a small amount of resources out there. So I knew I was going to have to do layers. Um, even though Jukari shot harder back then, they still don't shoot hard enough where they just pick up everything, uh, Not certainly not the version that Nick was running. So I was going to need to layer my objectives that I'd have like a devil fish in front or some drone units, and then I'd have breachers behind the obsec trying to be tucked safely behind. Um, we call that the uh, the blooming onion of death. It's been <laughs> patented by uh, Brad Chester. So I've been doing this well before Brad Chester. Was. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Pretty sure Brad but, was played before you were alive. Honestly, he, he was. He, he was. Like he was. I like to tease him. Um, but yeah, so I knew I was going to have to set up layers to this, and then on top of that. Um, because Jukari are also an extremely fast army, even though Nick was going to split his forces between the two large ruins on either corner of Dawn of War, uh, he was able to, he was going to be able to support them, uh, each other, um, because of the sheer mobility of his army. So I knew he was going to be separated for the early turns, but could come back together, uh, if needed. So, um, analyzing this game in retrospect, do you want me to give you a synopsis of the game first or, uh, yeah, give me a quick, what secondaries did y'all take? I took the same exact ones. I always take engage uh, to the last and then um, the uh, deploy scramblers. And then he took grind them down. He took uh, herd the prey, the Drukari secondary. Yeah. And then he took, um, what was the third one that he took? Was uh, also ret um, deploy scramblers. So he, he took what those. What does the, the herd the prey for those listening, what does that one do? That one is you can't score in the first battle rounds. And for every table quarter, your opponent doesn't have a unit wholly within at the end, of, and more than six from the center, I believe, um, you get two points at the end of your turn. So with Drukari, where they're an inc insanely powerful close-range army, once you're in their table quarters, they have the speed to interact with you, they have the shooting and the combat to deal with it. 
So it's very easy for them to starting turn two get four points, four points, four points max. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, that's a tough secondary to deny. But how? Uh, and unfortunately, the remores don't deny it because they're aircraft. That would have yeah. been amazing because then they would have. But um, so those are the secondaries that we picked. Um, how the game played out. Nick got the roll for first turn, which I didn't mind. I actually prefer going second typically, um, and especially on the heavier. Top tables at ACO, I wasn't going to be able to shoot very much anyway. So I'd rather him put resources out in the objectives and then I get to shoot them away and have that 15 points late game because I knew he wasn't going to kill me. Um, Jukari, I mean, just doesn't have enough um, damage if it, if it wants to. If you want to do enough damage to this Tau army, you have to throw your army in the center of the table. And I know Nick wasn't going to take that risk. So I could play with that in mind. Um, so. What basically happened was he moved up, he moved the Archon onto an objective and put the Sliss Urgles at an angle where I couldn't see them and still within three. So uh, he was just going to be able to bodyguard. I was never going to be able to deal with that, unfortunately. Um, and then he moved his Kronos up, advanced them, rolled the six, and was able to, this is why I was talking about like inches matter, able to get um, his Kronos guns on the bare edge of my Devilfish that's in my oh, deployment no. zone in the corner behind Obscuring Terrain. So with that, he was able to shoot and then fire and fade them back behind, you know, towards me, towards my Ruin, where he was going to be able to clear space and then bring down uh, Mandrakes to get a deploy scrambles back there. So already, that, that was a huge deal. Um, I was fine with him advancing and shooting it um, if, if he rolled the six, because I was just counting that he wouldn't roll that, so I was slightly in, just slightly in range. I could have been completely out, but then I would have potentially given up Dark Lance angles. In retrospect, I should have just taken that because more Dark Lance is out in the open, the, the better for me. Um, and instead, I allowed him to get this Fire and Fade play off and put the Kronos basically almost into my deployment zone where they're going to clear a hole for his Mandrakes. So that was already a, a big mistake on my part. Then... Um, he, he basically was just setting up for the next turn, moved some raiders into the middle ruins, ready to start sending out Incubi and Obsec, uh, which is the next turn. So turn one, had to do something. Um, wasn't going to be able to act, interact with those Kronos, unfortunately, because they got that fire and fade behind the, the terrain. So what was the thing? Well, I moved the Riptide out and was able to shoot away a raider behind the objective and then fire and fade back. Um, and then I was able to just start setting up you know, control of the objectives and um, at this point, I, I think it was this turn where I shot into five Cabalites on the objective and only left one alive. So he was able to get um, uh, 15 points on, on a primary because a uh, second thing happened where I rolled three ones in a row on my two-man drone units to advance onto a middle objective. And I didn't want to leave the Riptide out there because it was a, to the last. So... Uh, I had to just accept that he was getting 15 early. Now, at the end of the day, I know I have a 15 late game, so it's not the end of the world, but because he had that Archon bodyguard play, I knew he was going to consistently get five, and giving him zeros was going to be really difficult. So this was a really big, big deal. However, I also was still fine because I had bottom of the turn, and he had grind them down, and he was never going to get grind them down. He got zero on it in the, in the wow. course of the game. So uh, you'd expect with all the little units that I have, but Jukari has tons of little units, and I kill a lot harder than his army. So he ended up getting a zero on that, and because I knew I had 15 primary on uh, bottom of five, it wasn't the end of the world, but it certainly was going to make this game even tighter. And so I had to be very careful with primary from now on. Um, I sent the remora out to get me the two points on engage and, and continued on. Um, I knew he was going to get heard the prey points early. I was hoping to give him eight and then the last two turns just deny it, uh, period, um, or he gets two points. So I was trying to just not let him get maxed there because I knew I had almost, I'm going to have 13 points on engage and I'm going to have 15 on to the last. If I can give him zero on grind them down, that'll keep him, um, that'll knock out this 15 that he got on primary and or even it out. And then I assumed we would both get to play scramblers. So I can try and win the secondary game and then keep the primary game even was what I was going for. Um, yeah. Once I realized what was happening turn one. So from there he makes some you know, charge moves, whatnot, and uh, we trade on primary. He's able to do a really good job because of that Kronos play to take me off that half of Dawn of War. And so now I have to push up and make it hammer an anvil instead. And uh, eventually I do that. I blow away everything in the middle ruin, and he had another turn where a single Incubi also lived on that objective and got him an extra five primary points when otherwise, you know, he would have uh, 
only gotten a five. And once again, it, it turned out to be huge in the score uh, at the end of the game, but uh, was really hoping that that didn't happen. And I just couldn't commit enough resources at that angle uh, because there were two large L's in the middle and the objectives were kind of hidden. So I had to really expose my army in the outward flanks to, to shoot them. Now, um, I was able to blow an entire unit of Kronos away, the second unit, when he popped out with them to hold a middle objective. And he didn't expect the single unit of uh, Veteran Crisis to pick it all up, but it just shot him. I put the um, plus, two, plus one to hit and the reroll wounds on it, picked them up, no problem. And I also sent the Riptide up and was able to shoot away a uh, raider, another raider uh, on that side. And then I used it aggressively to tie up his Dark Technomancer Rax because I knew he wanted to keep contesting the objectives on my side by using uh, Fire and Fade plays. So instead, um, because he was running low at CP at this point, I, uh, I charged in my Riptide. I knew it wouldn't die in combat, um, and if he overwatched, it still wouldn't die, even against the, the, flame, the Technomancer Flamers. And I tied them down so he wouldn't be able to contest my primary so I could get tens in this late game period. Now, um, he got Scramblers, I got Scramblers with the Vespid, and... What it came down to was the crisis suits. Like I said, late game, I, when my opponent doesn't have enough damage left, I, I charge them in. And I needed to, because he got that extra five points twice in a row from a single model living, I needed to give him um, a zero this turn to guarantee that I win. Um, and so the crisis suits had to make a really ambitious charge. Um, they had to shoot away a unit of incubi, a unit of uh, witches, and then make a charge into the Kronos, a homoculus, and then use the consolidate move to tag a model on the objective with the Archon. So this was going to be a very ambitious move, but it was possible. And so I needed uh, an 8 or a 9-inch charge, and I had CP for a reroll. And if I do it, it's pretty much guaranteed that it'll happen. If not, um, then uh, I'll lose by a couple points. And so that I ended up failing the charge, even with the reroll. And... Uh, that ended up denying me enough points to come back, um, but it, I think it was—I think it was like a six or seven point game. Jeez, so those five point rounds really mattered. It was because game. the charge move would have denied him. Um, uh, it would have denied him. Heard the prey points in one quarter, uh, and then it would have uh, been able the to primary. deny him objectives. Yeah, on the primary. So where do you think you could have made a different play there that would have affected the game? Is there anything you could have done on one of those turns where you where he got the fives or the or an extra five on primary? Mm -hmm. So uh, what what I should have done is actually um, with the crisis unit, the angling that I took, I wanted them more central in the middle of the board so that I could shoot either way um, due to where the objectives were placed so that with their 8-inch move and potential advance, they could get firing angles either way, whichever side Nick overcommitted to. Um, but in that case, they weren't able to shoot at the two, uh, the one objective on my side, and so I had less shooting that way. And I should have just went really hard turn one and made it hammer and anvil immediately. And in that case, just accept that the other flank was going to be gone and then late game push up through the middle. Yeah, um, and just sense. clear everything on that side as possible because he used that side to just deny me primary points uh, or hold my primary down while controlling the other half of the board. And if I had just taken control, we would have been even, and I had the advantage of bottom and turn and giving him zero and grind them down. So that was definitely a mistake on my part. I should have just pushed insanely hard, just move everything advance up, use the devil fish to screen and the two-man drone units. I have the, uh, the grab drone there for minus D3 to charges. And just make it so if he brings the Dark Technomancer Rax out, yeah, they'll kill a couple things, but then I wipe all of them in return, and I control that flank. Um, so that was definitely... A, so it started with that early positioning mistake on the Devilfish, which let him clear that side of the board and deny me primary on that side. Because I plan to just send out Breachers after Breachers into the middle objective and deny him points that way, so he's only getting 5s or 10s. Uh, it turns out he was getting 10s, guaranteed, because I wasn't able to contest that one as easily. And it also meant that my crisis, because that happened, my crisis suits were tempted to go that direction to kill whatever he was leaving on that objective when my original plan was to just send the OPSEC breachers out of the Devilfish to contest it um, instead of going for killing on that side. So that mistake actually compounded and really um, cost my overall... It made me play a less efficient strategy than I otherwise would have. I'm pretty sure I've never had a guest recount an episode so crazily accurate and two months later. This is... 
when Nick says you're a robot, I I 100% get it now. You literally just I'm I'm watching him and he's recounting this from memory, just like spitting it off verbatim, like exact numbers, like. And you got to recall, this is two months ago that this event happened. So I'm, mm-hmm. I'm freaking impressed, man. That's second crazy. week of June. Yeah, second week of June. I'm. Oh, it was a good man. game, though. Like, super tight. There were a lot of people watching, uh, and we were having a great time. It ended in, like, an hour and a half. That's how quickly we played. Wow. So, man, that uh, I really appreciate you coming on and talking about that game and talking about, uh, you know, your general strategy going forward with Tau and just different armies. And um, I'm looking forward to part two. And in part two, we're going to – I think we should, we're just going to break down Tau, man. We're going to talk about some Tau. We're going to talk about it. some of the plays you talked about earlier in the game or yeah. earlier in the episode when you, uh, when you had mentioned some different strategy you can use and things. I think we'll just talk about it, man. I know this is a break from our normal part twos on episodes, but I think we have you here. Let's uh, let's tap into some of that town knowledge for our listeners here. So you don't hear about them often, that's for sure. No, no. I, I think when we have you, we're gonna trap you and make you talk about it more. So <laughs> no escape doesn't work on me. I, in another game in ACO, I rolled uh, <laughs> I, I, um, in three turns in a row. I beat the no escape roll without having wow. to do anything. Yeah, it was awesome. We do have a Q&A, but this episode was kind of, uh, we didn't get a lot of uh, time to get our questions in for it, honestly, because uh, with the uh, other Art of War guys at Charity Hammer and with Orlando coming up, our tegel- schedules have been kind of tight. So I do have one question. I always mm-hmm. do my standing question from Blake Law, and that question is, what events are you doing this fall, Richard? So we got a lot of events coming up with the Art of War team as a whole. Uh, first up, I am going to Games Workshop Orlando. I am then going to um, the Las Vegas team event in September, and that'll be with uh, the Art Award team, of course. And then I will be doing uh, Games Workshop New Orleans, and then Games Workshop Austin as well, and then rounding out the season with LVO, almost certainly. Those are ones uh, we have tickets ready for. So a lot, so of, a lot of big majors. Everything with you. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I'll be there with you on all four of those. That's exciting. Excellent. Hopefully so, we play. Oh, yeah. I'm looking forward to it. I need to, <laughs> need to learn get learnt on some 40K, so... <laughs> I, I'm gonna tell you, man. You're gonna. I'm gonna play some chaos dice. I'm gonna be sneaky on you. We're gonna. We're gonna be doing a, an unbroken episode where you're accounting the uh, the chaos knights, putting some hurt on you. I, I to uh, <laughs> in my run in uh, 2019, I had to play chaos knights in like two different like finals slash semifinals or whatever. Uh, just they just happened to make it at Warzone Atlanta, for instance, and uh, was able to play against a really good opponent and uh, got tons of practice against them. So funnily enough, I do know chaos knights. Yeah. Well, all right then. Hey, thanks for listening, everybody. Make sure to check out all of our products at theartofwar40k.com. We have many coaching services there. You can hire Richard Siegler as a coach. We got Brad Chester. We got John Lennon, Nick Nanavati, uh, Matt Morisoli. I mean, there's a, there's a whole bunch of people on there that are there available for coaching, all top tier players. Check out the War Room where you can join our Facebook group. We have coaching videos posted daily there to teach you how to play different strategies like we talk about on the episode they have coaching games where they break down their moves uh when they play against each other all kinds of stuff available there on the art of war 40k.com make sure to check out our other podcast art of war down under with adam camilleri make sure to check out art of war vanilla with tim penny and john lennon and remember this is the art of war pistachio it is the podcast you didn't know you liked till you tried it now you love it so thanks for listening join us for part two Like what you just listened to? Check out Art of War and the Art of War Down Under podcast on the competitive 40K network. The Art of War 40K.com.